humble mind. Today, I'm going to be talking about a true hidden gem that practically no one knows about. I don't mean like, hey guys, have you heard of Sly Cooper? I mean, this is a real hidden gem that I can pretty much guarantee you that had you not clicked on this video, you probably would have never heard of this game. When I first played this game, there were literally only four Steam reviews out at the time for it, and this is a Steam-only game. And even at the time I'm recording this voiceover, there are still less than 10 reviews out there. I beat this game and absolutely loved it, but I wanted to wait a little bit and let my thoughts and feelings marinate before I said what my knee-jerk reaction was to this game so that I could make sure that my feelings stayed upon further reflection. Those honeymoon feelings I had with this game did stay, and in fact, I enjoyed the game so much that I partnered with the developer to do my very first giveaway that I've ever done on this channel, where I'll be handing out 5 copies of this game for free to 5 lucky people. If you have Steam and you enjoy RPGs, stay tuned for the details on that at the end of this video. As I said, this is an RPG and that's great because RPGs are my favorite genre. I've found that nothing really feels as grandiose or as involved or as moving as an RPG in most cases. From turn-based to tactical to action RPGs, from Japanese to Western styles, I've played a lot and because of that I have certain expectations. I've been lucky enough to play some of the best RPGs of all time. So when Eve of Calamity's developer reached out with a review code asking me if I wanted to check their game out, shortly after I released my video review for Exophobia, I made no guarantees. While I love them, RPGs are often big time investments and I don't want to cover something if I don't like it since negativity isn't really my thing here on this channel, and considering that many of the RPGs I've played and enjoyed in the past are considered some of the best of all time, I felt like this little indie title faced some steep, steep competition. However, I watched a little footage, I saw some screenshots, and thought to myself, you know what, let's give this game a good two hours or so and see how we feel. And to be honest with you, I didn't know what to expect. Well, after beating the game start to finish twice and seeing three or four different endings due to reloading multiple saves to see those different outcomes, I guess you could say I liked it. In fact, I am happy to say with my full chest, even after giving myself some time to let the hype rest a little, that Eve of Calamity is a fantastic RPG. And I don't just mean that it's great considering that it was made by a small staff, though Clothscape the developer is an indie studio of only a few people. I don't just mean that Eve of Calamity is great considering it's quote unquote another RPG Maker game, though it was made in RPG Maker, Eve of Calamity may very well be my favorite RPG that I've played this year so far, and I've played both modern favorites and well-known classics recently. Unfortunately, as I said before, this game isn't getting the attention it deserves, and I'm very much afraid that it's going to continue to go overlooked, so I thought I'd try my best to get some eyes on it with my review. I've made you wait long enough, let's freaking do this. Let's talk about Eve of Calamity. The story. The game starts by giving you the option to choose your class. From the beginning of the game, you can start as either a fighter, mage, bard, berserker, cleric, or rogue, and as you can imagine, they all have wildly different stats and abilities. After naming your character and doing all those sorts of things, your sibling wakes you up from a bad dream and you quickly learn that you've been growing up in this hut out in a remote location deep in the woods somewhere. Your father has been raising you and training both you and your sibling vigorously every single day for some sort of conflict that you've yet to learn about. After some some training, which serves as this game's brief tutorial on combat, you and your sibling go on a hunting trip looking for some deer. When you get back to your family's hut, you see your father in an apparent confrontation with some mysterious figures that you've never seen before. Conflict with these invading cultists ensues, and they overwhelm you pretty quickly. You wake up afterwards to find out that your sibling was taken by the cultists, and in his last remaining dying breaths, your dad reveals to you your destiny. Thus, Eva Calamity begins as you find out that your father was actually a well-known hero in the past. He was part of a squad who helped seal away the legendary monster, the Beast of Calamity, 20 years ago, and he's been preparing his children to carry the mantle as he knew that seal was breaking. 
On his figurative deathbed out there in the snow, he tells you to head to the neighboring town, and now armed with the knowledge of the Beast of Calamity and the fire in your heart that burns to find your sibling, your quest begins. After this, where does the story go, you ask? Well, I can't really tell you. And that's one of the best parts about this game. Though Eve of Calamity has a decidedly old-school JRPG type of look to it, the game's story actually has a lot of modern sensibilities because this is an open-world game. You can experience anything the game has to offer at any pace you want and in any sequence you want. I asked Pinty, the developer of this game, what the inspiration was for making the game this way instead of a more curated, linear experience like you might expect. And while he said that the older Final Fantasies were a huge inspiration aesthetically and thematically for this game, especially Final Fantasy II, some of his favorite gaming experiences were tied to old randomizer mods for those classic Final Fantasy games. So he knew he wanted to inject some of that feeling into his own game. And when it comes to the quest lines that you'll encounter along your journey, his principal inspiration was Fallout 1, a CRPG well known for instilling that sense of unbound open world exploration. There is a very large amount of potential recruitable partners to find in the world of Eve of Calamity as well, and this he said originated from his love of the first Baldur's Gate. So what this effectively means is that everyone's playthrough of this game is going to be unique. Though on the surface it might seem like it takes a lot of inspiration from Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, where this game differs from classic RPGs is its varied nature. The party members you meet are unique in every playthrough. In fact, when I played the game for the second time, many party members I found along my journey were characters I had never previously seen or interacted with in my first playthrough. The weapons, armor, items, and spell scrolls you find have some sort of randomization to them too. On my first playthrough, for example, one of the very first chests I found had a simple dagger or something like that, but on my second playthrough, that same chest gave me a scroll that taught my main character how to cast a low-level earthquake spell, which that early in the game was pretty strong. The longer you take to finish your quest of beating the Beast of Calamity, the stronger it becomes, which can drastically alter the outcome of your final fight. You can choose to take down the five elemental towers just as the prophecies foretold, or you can do your best to make a mad dash straight for the final boss if you're confident enough. You can recruit a whole slew of party members, or stick with the first few you find and reject the rest or kill them if you want to. You can attempt to employ some diplomacy between orcs and men or encourage them to fight one another. You can try to end a civil war or choose a side and fight for that side or ignore that battle altogether. You can become a master of imports and exports and become the richest person in the kingdom, or you can make your money by becoming a monster hunter mercenary, or you can steal from others to get gold. You can attempt to end the lover's quarrel, which will go way different than what you're probably going to expect. You can face an army of the undead, or you can even have a member of the undead join your cause, which I'll talk a little bit about later. You'll meet people, creatures, and the like who fit familiar character archetypes and fantasy tropes, and others who completely turn those tropes on their heads. You can spend a great majority of your time on the mainland or set sail to the neighboring islands pretty much immediately and apply for citizenship there if that's more your speed. There are whole towns that you may not even explore on your first playthrough, or you can try to see everything like I did, but I guarantee you'll find something new on your second playthrough even if you're thorough, trust me. Pretty much every character that joins you in your journey has their own desires and reasons for why they do what they do, and you can choose to help them on their individual quests so that you can learn more about them and empower them, or you can choose to only focus on the ones that are most interesting to you, or you can keep the focus entirely on your own journey. It's up to you. And the best thing about all of this is that even in my thorough first playthrough where I tried to see and do everything I could, I still beat the game in about 22 hours. Despite everything you can do in this game, it's very well paced. 20-ish hour RPGs like Chrono Trigger or Super Mario RPG always receive praise for how little fat is in these games thanks to their short runtime packed with meaningful activity, and Eve of Calamity is no different. In my second playthrough, I wanted to get the fast savior achievement, which is where you beat the Beast of Calamity before it recovers its powers, and I managed to pull that off in about 5-ish hours since I knew where to go and what to do. I was also the first person in the world to do so by the way, according to the developer, so. My point here, and hopefully you're seeing this by now, is that there is so much you can choose to do and not do in this game, yet you're never wasting your time farming enemies or doing fetch quests. Nothing feels bloated here. For combat. 
Though I realize that turn-based RPG combat can be hit or miss for many, especially in today's modern age where I think it's falling a bit out of favor now that we're more exposed to action RPGs more than anything else, I still am a big fan of this type of battling. It's kind of relaxing for me. Where Eve of Calamity shines the most in regards to its combat is the strategic elements that you're able to employ. When battling, you have four things to watch out for. Your hit points or your HP, your magic points or your MP, your technical points or TP, and your activity bar. Since I think most people are familiar with how HP and MP works, I'll cover the other stuff. Your activity bar functions a whole lot like they do in most other active turn-based RPGs that you may have seen before, where over time it grows and once it's at full, it's your turn to attack. You can see your opponent's activity bars as well. The speed at which it grows is based on a variety of things, your character's speed stat, any buffs or debuffs they may have, and whether or not they defended the previous turn, among other things. When it comes to technical points, these are built up over time as well. No character ever starts with a full 100 TP at the beginning of battle as far as I'm aware. Character is not known for using magic as often, like a warrior or rogue or whatever. They usually have more TP oriented special attacks. Again, if you defend for a turn or use an item or something like that, you'll receive way more TP in the next turn than you will if you use an attack or use magic. So sometimes it's advantageous to actually wait for a turn so that you can build up the TP necessary to use a special ability. And also while you're waiting, maybe your partner can give you a buff so that the ability you use on that next turn is even stronger. Additionally, because you can see the enemy's activity bars, you can strategically choose to either take out the enemy that's moving the fastest or maybe the strong and slow one. Maybe you want to take that one out first before it can even act. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, there are character classes like mage, bard, cleric, and so on. As you level up and develop mastery over your classes, your character can transition into new classes to learn new abilities. Again, this might be something you're familiar with already, but if not, this means that your character can gain new abilities from their new specialization on top of knowing the abilities they learned from their old classes. And that makes for really unique amounts of customization and potential for synergies with every character. You can learn spells and skills via level up, but alternatively, you can learn them simply through finding ancient scrolls, and these scrolls are not one-time use items, so that means that you can give a particularly good spell or skill to multiple party members if that's what you want to do. And this results in the ability to double buff or double debuff across the course of a turn, and so as you can imagine, there is a lot of room for player expression in how you you approach a battle. You can have an all-out offensive team who destroys the opposition before they even really get a chance to do anything. You could have a tanky team who heavily mitigates damage, or you could have an interesting mix going where someone's a mage, someone's a support buff type character, one swings really hard, and maybe another one is incredibly fast. And because there are so many optional characters that can make up your party along the way, if there's one that isn't really gelling with you, you can always recruit someone else or make the character you're not so fond of do a class change so that they can potentially align better with what whatever it is you're trying to go for. For example, I met this character named Shomari who has a background as a fighter. While I initially kept her on the team just for raw damage output, as she leveled up I noticed her magic points actually weren't too bad either, so I got a new idea. I had her read some magic scrolls so that she could do some buff magic and buff my main magic user at the time and debuff the enemy's magic resistance. And that magic resistance spell was also a spell my main character had, so in one turn I could double debuff the enemy and then my magic user would follow up with a poison arrow spell and do massive damage. So someone who was once a fighter that I really put on the team because she just simply did a better job hitting the opponent than my thief could. She actually ended up turning into more of a paladin type character who could support our squad and hold her own on the battlefield as well. I also wanted to just quickly mention that I really enjoy how the equipment works in this game. Certain weapons, like a fire axe for example, can carry secondary effects like fire damage or whatever, which isn't terribly uncommon in RPGs. But something unique about Eve of Calamity that I really enjoyed is that the weapons in this game don't necessarily just improve your attack stat. In a very common sense sort of way, many weapons carry other types of benefits too. For example, a spear or a lance will actually give you a bit of a defense boost too because, logically speaking, when using weapons like this in real life, you give yourself some distance between yourself and your enemy. A 
knife on the other hand will not give you that same defense boost, but it may give you a speed boost since it's so much lighter and easier to wield. I'm amazed that more RPGs don't do something like that. This game does have a pretty high encounter rate that's common with older RPGs, but being a fan of classic RPGs myself, that wasn't a big deal to me. I actually find random battles relaxing, and I fought in just about every battle I could until the final dungeon where I was anxious to make my way to the final boss, so I just ran a lot. It is pretty easy to escape battles if you don't want to get into them though. Oddly enough, something about this game that I didn't expect to find was that it really made me wish I could play it on my Switch or my Vita because I found the battles sort of relaxing and I sort of daydreamed about grinding it out a bit with my characters while watching TV with my fiance or whatever, and that made me realize like, I think this is the first Steam game that I've ever truly played that made me wish I had a Steam Deck. I did manage to get the game to work alright via Steam Link on my phone and that scratched the itch well enough for me. Though there was a little bit of lag due to my Wi-Fi not being the best, another benefit of turn-based RPGs is that lag isn't really the biggest deal because reaction times and precise inputs aren't really a thing here. And I did mention grinding it out a second ago, but you don't need to grind. This game is actually pretty generous with XP in my opinion, and if you get into a healthy amount of battles, you'll usually level up enough to take on whatever you'll come across without a hitch. Though, of course, some optional bosses are harder than others, and like many classic RPGs, especially in the beginning, you'll be a little weak comparative to certain monsters. Thanks to Eve of Calamity's open world design, you can just leave the dungeon that's giving you trouble, help the next town over and get stronger, and then come back and wipe the floor with the enemies who were giving you a hard time before. The Characters now, earlier in the combat section, I mentioned that in one of my playthroughs, I replaced my thief rogue character for a fighter slash paladin type character instead because I personally enjoyed how much harder they hit. But one really cool interaction that only occurred when I had that thief, Flynn, in my party was that when we went to the dangerous back streets of Asterna, other thieves wouldn't attack us because of his notoriety as a famous thief. Enter these areas with any other character in your party and you're bound to get mugged and either take the loss or get yourself into a potentially life-threatening battle. Also thanks to Flynn, there is a thieves guild of sorts that you can gain access to quite easily. One character is just a dreamer and artist who wants to go sightseeing and tell tales of her adventures. Another is this hardened warrior who must defeat a certain legendary local monster before his village will allow him to call himself a man. One is a famous singer who has stalkers that won't stop trying to apprehend her at every turn she makes. One is estranged from her family, and there are likely many other stories tied to party members that I still haven't met yet. But I can confidently say that this game does have one best boy, and that's Alfred. Please, if you do anything upon playing this game, meet Alfred, recruit him, fall in love with him, and protect his bony self at all costs, because he is easily one of my favorite video game characters of 2024. Alfred may look like a straight up Grim Reaper, My name is Grimmy, and I've come to reap your immortal soul. But he has a metaphorical heart of gold. He's a ghoul of sorts who I found in a random battle in the overworld, but my party members noticed that he didn't seem especially hostile, so I was given the option to suddenly talk to him. I decided to hear him out, and we discovered that Alfred is on a quest to discover the whereabouts of his master, who is this sort of necromancer scientist that reanimated him as well as many others back to life. He doesn't have memories of his past self or where he came from, and so he's on a mission to determine that. If you agree to help him, he'll join you, and he's a very powerful spellcaster. In fact, he was the quote unquote main magic user on my team that I was talking about earlier, and the one character in my first playthrough that I never once removed from my party aside from the main character. Alfred's quest is perhaps the longest and most involved side quest in this game, and I'm not going to spoil the outcome of it or the details, but it was legitimately one of the coolest and most memorable quest lines I've ever done, and really brings to mind the side quest related to a certain ghoul in Fallout 3, if you know, you know. And on a side note, a hobby of mine is collecting wallpapers for my computer from any games that I end up playing that mean a lot to me or I think are gorgeous. And after beating the game, I went back and made a sort of fan art wallpaper for Alfred and put it in that folder so it occasionally pops up. That's how much of a fan of this spooky little skeleton I was. The Criticisms now, I did save this for the end because I didn't want people to potentially turn away if I were to harp too long in the beginning on any faults that this game may have, but yeah, this game wasn't perfect. 
I found a few minor typos here and there, but that's not really a big deal to me. Sometimes NPCs would stand right in front of the doorway and block me for a time, which was annoying, but also something I could kind of laugh at. But one criticism I had, and one that I think will unfortunately steer people away from this game, is that some of its promotional art and character portraits look a little amateur. When I first received this game, this was something that made me a little weary about trying it out. And I know that if I was a little on the fence about it, Chances are others might be too, and that's a shame because I think this game deserves more attention. And just so you know, I did talk to the developer about this prior to releasing this video just because I know when it comes to artwork, people can sometimes take those criticisms personally. I know I used to as an artist myself. But just so you know that I'm not blinded by my admitted love for this game, yeah, some of those character portraits are a little busted. I ended up actually going into the game files and replacing some of the character portraits with similar looking characters from other games like Fire Emblem and Final Fantasy and found myself enjoying the game infinitely more. I'm not one of those people who insist that you have to have attractive characters in video games, but rather that some of these characters just didn't seem heroic to me and when replacing Liliana for example with this similar character from Fire Emblem it was just easier on the eyes, easier for me to rally behind her, and it was more believable that she was a hero. And I'm glad I talked to the dev about this ahead of time because he actually explained that many of the character designers that they had paid to make portraits bailed at the last minute, and so his small and inexperienced team had to rush and create a bunch of portraits at the 11th hour, and I can't imagine how stressful that might have been. I also suggested using this piece that I whipped up pretty quickly just using the sprites from the game's files for the promo art pieces instead of the hand-drawn one that they used because I thought it better conveyed the game's art direction and looked more professional, and again I learned that it was an outside source that produced the main promo artwork for them. And while I think it's understandable and courageous to admit that there are certain things that these devs are not as experienced in or have less skill in, and I have no problem especially with a small indie studio outsourcing a little bit of their work here and there to help fill those gaps, I think they should give themselves a little more credit because my advice to them was just to let their pixel art speak for itself when it came to those monster designs and overworld sprites. I mean, just look at these monster designs. There's a huge variety of monsters within this game. You'll fight angels, demons, goblins, all kinds of spooky specters and things like that, dragons. There's a lot going on in this game. And not every character portrait is bad in my opinion. I didn't change Alfred, I mean, he's perfect. At the end of the day, all of this is subjective anyway. But overall, I still think that the battle backgrounds, certain cities, and monster designs especially are pretty freaking awesome. I think anyone who is a fan of classic RPGs like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, or Fantasy Star is going to appreciate the artwork this game has going on here. Couple that with the chiptune music that you've been hearing interspersed across this video, and overall, despite my criticisms, I still think this game has a lot of good going for it in the way of presentation. I especially like the boss battle theme music that takes this really out of left field doom metal approach in its instrumentation, with those heavy guitar-esque tones and double bass kicks. And to me, one of the greatest things about playing on PC is the customization that PC gaming offers. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't have had as much fun in a Hat in Time or Serious Sam as I did without replacing the character models occasionally with characters other people on the net uploaded. So while I'm not a big fan of certain character portraits, putting in my own more preferred ones was part of the experience and made the game feel more my own anyway. And if you're a PC gamer, chances are you probably relate to this. So if you're still here, you've heard about the open-ended plot of this game. You've seen what I have to say about the combat and the characters and also even heard some criticisms. If you've watched all of this, I have to imagine that you either just like to hear me talk, which, well, thank you, or you think this game is actually really sick and you're wondering about that giveaway. Or you skip to the end of this video strictly for the giveaway, which, hey, watch the rest of this video too, I promise it's really light in the spoiler department. But yes, I enjoyed this game so much I asked Clothscape if I could get some codes to do a giveaway, and they generously said yes. I have 5 Steam codes to give to 5 lucky people. If you have Steam, you like RPGs, and this seems like it's up your alley, then all I ask is you tell me a little bit about one of your favorite RPGs in the comments. Please stray away from spoilers, I don't want other people to get upset, but tell me in general what you enjoy about one of your favorite RPGs. After a few days, I'll go through and pick my favorite comments, and if I choose you, I'll make a post sharing who the lucky winners are, and I'll email you with a Steam code to redeem. So please just make sure that you're also subscribed if you're not already so you don't miss that post in case you're a winner. 
I want to give a sincere thank you to Clothscape for introducing me to legitimately one of my favorite gaming experiences of the 2020s, and thank you, the viewer, as well for watching me to the end like this. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.